sorry to uh, hello everyone uh, to give like to welcome to this seminar so today we are honored to have Sarahu join us to give this seminar talk so Sarahu is a very uh, like uh, I would say high profile social fair uh, that domain so he views uh, state autonomous less systems uh, using a lot of methods right four methods machine learning controls and uh, he applied to a lot of things right including autonomous vehicles which we all know how critical they are, right? So, and also uh, medical devices, air mobility, uh, air mobility, and so on and so forth, right? So, uh, he is actually a leader. He did a lot of very huge grants uh, across the nation. Um, he's the uh, pen director for the uh, DOT's actually 20 million, right? So, 20 million CP, CP21 National UTC. Uh, he's also director of the Outdoor Center of Excellence uh, for Autonomous Driving, uh, in consortium of Actually, over 70 companies uh, and the universities focused on building uh, open source of like autonomous vehicles. So. And then uh, for normal speakers, I'll probably say, okay, that's just a subtle word, like Korean word, and I say Rahu. That's just means nothing, right? Because Rahu is usually get a much more words and a much more, more prestigious ones than that. For example, the so called the, the PK like award, that, that's the uh, presidential early career award from the President Obama for, for his work for life critical systems and a um, long list of many, many other, other words from uh, including many from the NAD, right? The uh, National so the National uh, uh, Academy of Engineering. So, uh, and also many classes of work. So, uh, yeah, today he's going to talk about more about his recent research. So, let's uh, welcome him. Very much. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be back. I was here maybe, I think. Everything is pre-COVID before that, so maybe 10 years ago. But uh, so today we're going to have really fun discussion and, you know, on uh, building life critical and safety critical systems. So once uh, you put your software in these systems and you deploy them uh, and your life, you know, you're, you're basically saying, well, let the decisions be on, on our behalf and you're letting it go, right? So, so now how can you ensure situations and not not kill yourself or kill others right so so we are really putting software to a very high bar now and uh, so I, I direct the X lab and as you can see it's a very open-ended uh, we are really just interested in all of these life critical problems we don't care which uh, domain is because in whichever domain we pick we then want to dive deep into that domain and understand what the issues are over there um, so so in terms of like, you know, my research focus, uh, I, we built a lot of, you know, mathematical models of systems, and I'll talk about them like the human body, like autonomous systems, and the interactions with the environment um, and, and with other agents. And the idea of these mathematical models and the logic is that we are able to then verify their behavior under all possible conditions. And now that's a very, you know, presumptuous statement, what is all possible conditions? And so that's what we'll try to break down. And they're always interle they always sort of interconnected to control systems. There's always a closed loop between the physical system, between the computational system, between the environment. And then we use a lot of machine learning under the hood, so within our tools. Usually this is for you know capturing very complex dynamics and behaviors of the interaction of these systems. And so we want to incorporate that. But no matter what problem we pick, we have the same question is how can we have these safety and performance guarantees uh, you know, for these closed loop life critical systems? And so I'll briefly, very briefly talk about you know, how we applied this over the past decade in implantable medical devices. This is not the main course, it's just the appetizer. I think the last time I was in uh, UC Irvine, I spoke mostly about the medical stuff, but I'll just, Use that as an instance, right? So we're talking about autonomous vehicles, autonomous, uh, you know, engineered systems, but this is an autonomous system like, you know, a pacemaker or a defibrillator. And essentially the reason we started looking at this was uh, back in, you know, 2008 when I started at Penn, we just started to see a lot of recalls were due to software issues. And uh, mostly they were testing these devices especially like this kind of device, it's called an implantable pacemaker. So it's a cardiac pacemaker. 
essentially it has two leads over here that go that is the device is implanted in under your flesh by your muscle and then these two leads go into the atrium and the ventricle and they're screwed into the tissue and then once the tissue is scarred heals then basically these are cardiologists who are using these the devices are implanting them and they are electrical engineers but working inside of your body and then if your heart's beating too slow this will start to pace it up and so they test all these scenarios right and different ranges of your heart beating different kind of patterns but the problem is most of the tests are just open loop tests and what they would want to have is like your heart my before coffee after coffee my heart before a, like a long swim or uh, or after that and and we want to basically but now all our hearts are very different right and how can we test it out in a closed loop system so that was some problem that we started on like you know a decade ago and then we put like a heart on a chip system so we could verify and validate you know this this kind of system in a closed loop right do it from a formal verification so build models of the devices and the the physiology and verify them you know in a over approximated manner then automatically generate you know models of them that we can test and simulate and then falsify and prove that these systems are going to be safe under the large range of conditions but we are getting now from you know a very abstract <laughs> system to specific implementations and designs and then automatically code generate that system over here right so i'll pass this around this is about $23,000 take it home with you uh, so and, and and so this is kind of past work right it's it's that that whole it's a whole gen first generation of students passed out through that and and then they built a lot of tools but most of the tools were kind of simple in the sense that you know the device doesn't require like this you know uh, from the, the fluid dynamics of the system it does not require heavy duty like tissue modeling because this device is only interacting at two points in a very complex system. So it's kind of like you have two pin holes and you're looking at some very complex behavior, but you can only get these very local signals like these, um, um, at, at this. And so now then we had to model, you know, how, how can we actually now extrapolate uh, from those local signals? And then we had to generate this and build these kind of testing tools as we worked with that. Then we said, okay, let's get on to some more complex behavior, right? And, and that's with atrial fibrillation. So, but before that, we, you know, there's a different kind of device. That's a big fatter one. These are previous generation ones, right? Because from when we were doing the research, this is called the implantable cardioverter defibrillator <clears throat> or ICD. You see this in the movies, right? They're just saying stat, and then they, they basically are resetting or rebooting the person's heart. So inside of your body, when it's inside of your body, it provides about a 61 joule, 800 volt shock. And this costs about $34,000, right? <laughs> and, uh, depending on your insurance. I, so we also cut it open so you can see there's a, this second box that you'll see is a very large uh, ultra capacitor. And so essentially that's building up the charge and then it's gonna give you that charge. And essentially this happens when your body is at a very uh, fast uh, erratic rhythm. So it's a chaotic rhythm. It's not going book, 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 it's going it's going all around and then they cannot, you cannot uh, take a fast heart and slow it down. With the first device, you can take a slow heart and speed it up. And, uh, but uh, you cannot take a fast heart. You can take it and there are certain algorithms that do that uh, by out racing, you know, the, that, that very fast rate. But if your rate is above that, or it's very chaotic, like what we call atrial fibrillation, then it just is going to reset the heart. Now, the device can extend life. And then in this case, you know, they had a lot of recalls with these devices in the late 90s, still about 2015, the recalls just kept going up and up and up, right? So, but then what the physician comes and, you know, this is when they cannot solve the problem just with medication, just with devices. Now there is some structural problem in your heart. And essentially rather than the, the wave propagating in a uniform manner, there are these derangements and the wave sort of breaks out into different frontiers and then reforms again. The physician basically will, will put the patient on the table, they'll put these catheters from their legs going through the vein inside and they're gonna probe the heart and they basically are taking these probes and going one by one by one and building a geometric model of the heart and then a conduction model of the heart. And then they say, hmm, now 
where is this problem that is causing these you know, spurious triggers, there should only be one source of a trigger from the atrium going down to the you know, bundle of his to, you know, to, to the ventricle. So where, is that, where are these spurious triggers coming from? And then they go and burn that tissue. They have like a, uh, uh, like a, a high, high um, uh, frequency RF uh, catheter that goes and burns the tissue and essentially is killing the cells and forms scar tissue. And then that basically deactivates it. But they have this kind of search and destroy, search and destroy till they figure it out. But it's a very, but they don't have this beautiful 3D view all the time. This view is just for them to sort of look at the orientation. Mostly they're just looking at these 16 electrogram signals. These are not even as featured or the morphology is even simpler than electrocardiogram signals, which are on the surface. These e e e e e EMG signals over here. The EGM signals are just inside of your heart. They're the local signals. So what we said was, look, we can provide you a guidance tool that as you are navigating through, we'll export the geometry, the conduction map, and we will generate patient-specific models. And then while you're doing the procedure, we'll run all these simulations and guide and provide you guidance and as a heat map as to where could be possible locations for these Fourier signals. And then we can you can actually go and start to probe them and then speed up this because otherwise the patient is on the table for eight hours and they have to be awake. And every time they burn the tissue, they have to cardiovert the patient. That means they have to push them into atrial fibrillation and then they have to see whether it spontaneously terminates. If it doesn't, they have to again pull the patient back and then they have to again shock the patient, put them back and then again burn more tissue, burn more tissue and they're trying to figure out if they burn too much tissue, too much scar, then you become like Dick Cheney. Then you have to basically have a like a ventricular or atrial assist device, and every beat is artificially provided, right? So, uh, so, so, so then what we had to do was that we had to sort of work with the build the geometry in real time, run our heart models, which have a lot of diffusion <laughs> tensor uh, models. I'm not going to go into the details of that, and then we can start to put them into a mesh and make them actually and automatically tune this mesh so that it is just like your heart or just like my heart if I'm on the table there. Uh, and so under the mesh, you know, every, <clears throat> every vertex, these models are running and they're getting inputs and outputs and flowing through uh, the, the rest of the, the, the surface. And that is a thickness to the surface. So you are working through that. And then we can basically now sort of start to map, okay, well, where is the activity happening? Where is dead tissue? And based on dead tissue, how 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 is the wave actually breaking apart, and how is it causing you know complex behavior, and uh, so these complex behaviors could be like how the the, the waveform is progressing around uh, scar tissue, forming these things called rotors. This is a more chaotic behavior, and they they spontaneously form and then they propagate and then they spontaneously dissipate also, and and then we can start to build this sort of you know heat map and provide them this guidance as they go through this, right? And so we, through our patient trials, we're able to get models that are less than 3% error, so 97% accurate models to a specific patient in terms of their spatio-temporal accuracy of how their models behave. And, uh, and then that's sort of, but then we were like, okay, this is, this is great now. That's starting to go you know, with the physician uh, and the physicians are starting to incorporate that in the closed loop system. We said, okay, how can, we are just dealing with one patient at a time. How can we now scale our verification work to like clinical trials to thousands of patients? And mostly clinical trials for these are called class one devices because they are totally life critical. The software that runs inside them are making all the decisions. And uh, so for example, the software should decide, it, should I shock or not shock? And if it doesn't shock and it's a fatal, uh, fatal situation, then the patient will die. Or if it shocks and it keeps inappropriately shocking, that will dam damage the tissue also. And, and every time it shocks, you will not forget it. Like it, it, is a, it is a pretty psychological like, you know, uh, memory, right? So, so these, these trials, they take many years. This is just a phase three trial. They have to go through like you know, 10, eight to 10 years before this trial. And then this is the last stage. They cost you know, millions of dollars. This is pre-COVID inflation numbers. And then, uh, and then the problem is that more than 35% of these trials actually just fail because patients just drop out 
uh, this is attrition. So our our challenge was how can we use models, computer aided design models of patients and of the devices in a closed loop to uh, operate in a closed loop manner so that it can then be used as regulatory grade evidence. Essentially, then we can now take our hot models and generate our synthetic waveforms with our model devices and then run trials with them and, and, then, and then look at how that affects the outcome of a clinical trial prior to running a trial. We just say, this is my trial, this is my hypothesis. I have some data uh, that is just based on prior to the trial, you have not collected the data yet. And so that's all fine, right? So what we wanted to build was a, a basically a, a, a statistical framework to say, how can I replace, say if I have a trial of 2,200 people, can I replace 200 people just from the control arm with 11,000 virtual patients? But they have to be regulatory grade kind of you know uh, signals. And there's a lot of uncertainty, right? Obviously simulation is simulation, right? I'm probably as big a skeptic of any simulator that we design or any model. So there's uncertainty that's propagating through this. So how do you model the uncertainty? How do you then combine your real patients with your virtual patients? How do you come up with a statistical model for that? And then how do we quantify the uncertainty of the outcome, actually? Right? Even after that, you have some uncertainty. So, so we had built this framework as part of this design for computer-aided clinical trials. And we are then were able to show with some uh, uh, standard trials how we can generate large, you know, bodies of uh, or large cohorts of virtual patients to replace small parts of real trials. But then the other question was, can we use this computer aided clinical trials as a way to provide some guidance prior to running the trial? I'll give you one example. So there was this. There's this company called Boston Scientific, and there's another company called Medtronic, right? So Medtronic, many of you may have heard of. And so they're the two big you know, device companies. There are two other ones, but that's it. It's just about four implantable device companies for cardiac devices like these. So the, the, the Boston Scientific, and I don't care about the company name, just company A, Boston Scientific was like, hey, we provide algorithm to algorithm much better discrimination than Medtronic. And they said, we'll run the trial, we'll show that. And the marketing guy was like, I'll get promoted then. And, uh, and so, they, but, so they ran the trial and then six years later, they found out, oops, it actually is in the opposite direction. It was actually, I think about 34% worse than Medtronic. And, um, but it's also that they were inappropriately shocking patients 62% of the time over there, right? I'm Indian, I love free, but here you get one shop, you get one shop for free. I don't want that free, right? So, uh, and then, but so what we could do is with our computer aided clinical trial, we could show, we can't get the exact numbers, right? It's definitely we cannot predict that because we're not running it on the same patients. Uh, that is why you run a trial, but we can at least get the direction of the trial. And we could show that, that based on our models of, you know, uh, the devices and how the, the device code is working, you could actually do that. You don't even have to get the actual code, but the algorithms are detailed enough. And uh, also what we could show is that with our, how do we map uncertainty? For certain cases, like you know, simple uh, behaviors like tachycardias or bradycardias, slow and heart rates, uh, we have very high robustness in our prediction, but for let's say atrial fibrillation, very complex behavior, which we actually cannot characterize too well or model too well, we have no robustness. So then we can say, this is how you need to bias your trial uh, so that your trial is actually now, you know, uh, hitting the weakest point of your devices like that. So, so that's sort of the, the, the thing, the nice part of this, well, this is one of a series of grants that we had. This was an NSF uh, cyber physical systems frontier. The really nice thing I liked about it was that there were mathematicians, bio uh, physicians, uh, there were electrophysiologists, uh, computer science folks, I was a double E guy. Uh, and so it was a really good team where people were actually teaching each other a lot. And we had a lot of collaborative work uh, and learning from each other. Uh, also through, through the design, yeah, there were lots of students that, that graduated from that cohort uh, Many of them became tenured uh, professors, now associate professors, actually all of them. Uh, many went to completed grad school and good schools after that. And uh, all of this is captured on medcps.org. 
And uh, so now let's come to the main folks, right? So we all are here for autonomous driving and uh, beyond that, right? So, uh, so let's look at the same sort of situation now, but uh, with, a, with a different angle, right? So, so still we have you know, our autonomous uh, software that's running in these systems. Uh, but we'll look at it in terms of a multi-agent system, right? So I'm going to switch gears quite a bit. And so we call this mad games or multi-agent dynamic games and with racing. So, so this is a lot of work is supported by like, you know, our safety 21, which is our DOT center, uh, Department of Transportation Center. This is the fourth such center that we've had in the last 12 years. And then there's a lot of industry collaboration with AutoWare, which is a open source autonomous uh, driving software consortium. Uh, but basically autonomous driving is so complex uh, that we actually have many parties, like say, over 70 companies that come together to build this up, right? And, uh, and as part of that, we also, I direct the center for the R&D side with over 30 universities now. That is, they're just focused on the research part of it, right? So, and then we have F110, that's more of our outreach of, you know, engaging with the, the next generation of, of engineers. So we are all familiar with autonomous driving, right? That wave came, all the companies raised billions of dollars. They promised the um, amazing future and they were really good at raising money, really bad at making money. And then they all, okay. So the, the long story short is even if the technology worked, there is no clear business model for most of them. And even if there's a business model, the regulatory environment will not allow it because it's just so life critical that you have one or two accident cases and it's just going to be like, hey, it's a systemic driver. And uh, and so it's, it's the same driver in, in Beijing versus Bangalore versus, you know, uh, somewhere in San Francisco, right? So anyway, so, so as this vehicle, so this is the mundane situation. As the vehicle is trying to merge there, this yellow truck is not giving them way. But you and me, yeah, we go through this every day. We just nudge, nudge, eventually we get in and it's not a big deal, right? Because in everyday driving, you know, say I, I came in here like a few minutes late, they're like, okay, at least this guy's alive, right? They didn't say that, but, uh, but that's the assumption, right? Safety needs to be maximized for driving everywhere. But one or two minutes, few minutes late is, is okay, right? So don't worry, I won't do it anymore. So, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, but, but, so that just says that one side of the problem is well-defined, safety. Performance, ah. mm. So then we said, okay, we need a problem with tension. Okay, there has to be tension, there has to be safety, but something that's po pushing performance. So I asked everyone lab, what do you guys like? And guys and girls, they were like, we like Euro soccer and we like Formula One. And because the medical guys, we're not talking to the buildings controls guys, we're not talking to the autonomous systems guys. They're like, okay, let's come together. Let's, let's have some fun. Uh, you know, for, for a few years uh, working on this. So here you see, like, I think this is Alonzo and Vettel. They are uh, uh, running, they're driving at over, like, you know, 300 kilometers per hour, super high speed racing. And in this kind of racing, now you might, you see that you get penalized for being overly aggressive, you'll crash, or overly conservative, that means you won't, you won't be in that, you won't win. And that's a career choice. In fact, that's not even a choice. In fact, if you're half a second slower in your lap time, you're out of the top 10, right? It's so clear, you're just out. And uh, so, but it's not about just being fast only. Only 40% of the winners of the races from 1950 were, had the fastest lap time in that race. Only 40%. The, they were basically really good at balancing aggressiveness and restraint and doing that, you know, continuously through every turn, through every interaction. So we're like, okay, this is a really good setup. We, we don't want to sort of go too much more into just racing. Let's just use that as a setup for our problem, right? So, 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 so this, this problem, the other aspect is that it involves a lot of physics. You're looking at full dynamics, right? And, uh, and I, I can share all these slides with you. They're, they're all, all on tiny URL link, right? so, um, so, so essentially these are, uh, so you're operating at high speeds, high reaction times, but you're operating at the vehicle's limit of handling, at the limit of the tire so handling over there. Like you're going to the full extent of the slip until you basically will have a breakdown. 
Oh, because if you aren't operating at the limits of your handling, your competitors are, and they're going to outcompete. Right. So, so that's why we call it mad. The D of the mad games is the dynamics. Right. It's taking full dynamics into account. It's not just some discrete game that we are going to start playing over here. So obviously, crashing is very expensive and dangerous, and and then the other thing is you have all these sensors, LIDARs, radars, cameras. Uh, they just tell you what's the pose, and maybe there's a short-term prediction, motion prediction of the other agent. But they don't tell you what we really want to know. What's in the mind of the driver? What's the driver's intention? What's their driving policy? I want to know what's your driving policy. And as I get a good estimate of your driving policy, I can come up with a counter policy to outcompete you. Right? That's, that's our mission. So that's the problem in a nutshell. Uh, the other thing is you might say, oh, why don't you just look at the large, you have 1950 to, 90, to, to, to 2024 data, just look at all the races, but all the races are different. You can't just mine the previous year. It's not some supervised learning problem here. The, the cars change every year. The driver's mindset changes, the weather changes. Every, the strategies are different, right? We just can't mine previous races in, in that sense. So we actually are operating in a very small data regime we're going to assume I have no prior knowledge of my offerings. And, that, right? so I'm going to, and, and that's how the reason you might say, oh, why? This guy's just playing games and uh, yeah, we are. But, uh, but, <laughs> but what's the point, right? The whole point is that if we can design these superhuman agents, then we can get uh, safety through agility. That's my second <laughs> slide. End of that. So, so let's come back to our main. So our goal over here is how to generate the most competitive agents that can dynamically balance this safety and performance and, and do that balance based on all these environmental and interaction aspects. So we start with this. This is a, a previous uh, earlier work from ICML called Formula Zero. Formula One just basically defines the rules of the game. You know what Formula One is. Formula Zero is saying, I have zero knowledge about my opponent. And how can I still become adapt, adapt, adapt till I can outcompete? So I formulate this as a standard robust reinforcement problem where we want to minimize a set of expected costs over time of my interaction with the other agent. The problem is that you know I don't know how the other, what the other agent's behavior is. So I have to front this as a mini max problem here. But I, want, but I have this uncertainty set PSA for the state action probabilities of the other agent, with that, right? So, uh, and I can I only can partially observe them. I, I don't I can only observe them when they are next to me, uh, but I don't know about them from before, right? So, uh, so if we if we didn't if we knew the opponent's behavior, we don't need this you know inner max over here. Uh, so the the whole idea here is that you know for this uncertainty set or this ambiguity set, we need to come up with a useful parametrization of that. So how can I characterize that for the, the, my opponent? And obviously the larger the ambiguity set is, the more I'm going to sort of stay away from them because I don't know what their expected you know, paths could be. And I'm, I'm going to be more conservative, but the smaller the ambiguity set, I can come closer to them and drive more aggressive. Right? So I want to basically reduce the size of this ambiguity set. Let's start to characterize that, right? So our goal is to learn this useful parametrization. And so what we're gonna do is, never seen this opponent before, so I basically have a, you know, uh, imperfect information about them. So offline, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use population synthesis. I'm gonna use my own self-play approach to learn this parametrization of the set P. And I'm gonna generate a population of good racers. So I'm gonna say generate a, 20 or 100 driving policies that are all elite drivers. And then now I have that. I basically have this pool of elite agents. And then online, I'm going to use robust planning. And I'm going to sort of use this belief space planning against opponent. I'm going to say, hey, you're a mix of 17, 33, 42, 11, and 9. And I'm going to try to figure out, you know, you are kind of similar to these. And what is your weighted mix of my my offline, you know, uh, population of good racers. So, so we have, you know, our, our, we are mostly looking at like a local planning problem here. We're not, the race track is known. I don't have to worry about, you know, getting on my race line uh, and all of that part. But so I'm going to generate with a sampling based planner, you know, um, 
uh, good you know uh, goal sets over here that are dynamically feasible and based on the estimate of how my off minute is going to drive i'm going to come up with a minimum cost trajectory uh, that will allow me to make the maximum progress but also balance safety and performance while i'm doing that and uh, and so, but I just don't want to sort of characterize the opponent in terms of their steering angle and their velocity uh, and, and their position. I actually want to have something more descriptive, right? I basically want to capture their driving policy and as to how are they going to take this next curve? What kind of generation of, the, what is their trajectory generation probably? So offline, basically we are running what is essentially a search engine. So this is a gigantic optimization engine. This is uh, using this approach called parallel tempering, which uses a replica exchange MCMC -MC sampling. And it's just saying, okay, we're going to compete, compete, compete. We'll have two, two opponents compete. Whoever wins, they start to get progressed into from hotter baths to colder baths. And then at the end of this you know, set of competitions, they're going to generate the coldest bath over here, which is a set of elite agents. So say I have 20 elite agents, that is, they're the fastest in their minimum lap time but they are also very diverse. They don't have the same race line, so to speak, over here. They, they have different racing lines to, to get to that minimum uh, lap time over here. So they also, when they overtake, they don't just overtake from the inside, they overtake from the outside too. Uh, so they have diversity, right? So they are elite and diverse. That's important over here. And so now as I'm sampling and getting my feasible trajectories, I, I say I have this estimate now. I need to figure out this blue trajectory based on the opponent's policy, right? And once I can figure that out, then I will generate my trajectory to minimize the cost. Let's see how we can estimate this blue trajectory of my opponent here. Let's say I just have three opponent models, right? One, two, and then three over here. And then I'm just going to estimate, you know, how, how is the opponent driving if, I, if they were just to use opponent model one? in this situation. They're going to use opponent model two, opponent model three. And then here I have basically a multi-arm bandit problem where I want to minimize the worst case cost of my estimate. And I'm going to get the error that the opponent actually took this path. And so therefore they are like a weighted mix of these three policies, but I have this ambiguity. Right? That's why it's distributionally robust. Over here I have this ambiguity <clears throat> of, I don't have a perfect estimate and I have uh, so, so I, I have this uncertainty level over here, right? So, and I want to make basically make this uncertainty ball as small as possible. And so, uh, so, so as I'm observing the the opponent, I want to keep <coughs> updating that, right? So, as the opponent is even changing their strategy, for example, they start to move around, <clears throat> and uh, and then they start to. But of course, you know, in in a race, it's almost like a almost a one and a half D problem. You you're still going on the same path. You're not you're not coming up with some totally like, you know, different dimension of attack. Right? So um, they still have to make progress. Uh, so as they are, as we are observing them, we can keep updating, you know, how, what, what is the opponent's policy? And here, this is just showing that suppose the op I, I, I have six, you know, elite policies offline, then online, as I go through these observations, I figure out that they are a heavily weighted mix involving, uh, you know, opponent model five, uh, heavy, heavier than the other opponents, and this is the weighted mix. And then I can basically get a very good estimate like that, right? So, so this takes about, uh, you know, 150 to 300 observations running at about 10 hertz. <coughs> and um, so very quickly we can sort of start to get a good zone in as to what is the opponent's policy. So the first mini hypothesis was to say, okay, like if I have more robustness, that means that my uncertainty ball is still large, or I want to maintain a large, you know, spacing. Uh, then how does does that is that actually making me safer? So this is just saying there's higher robustness, the higher robustness, and this is just saying that in terms of time to collision, that I'm coming into this lower time to collision, almost accident case, very close to the opponent. Uh, that's less than five sec point five seconds, and I see that I'm in that risky scenario less. So that just says that, you know, as the larger the robustness ball, the more safer I'm becoming. But this comes as a, at a cost, right? The more safer or the more conservative I am, my win rate drops from about 60% to 50%. And that's a no-no because we are trying to balance safety and performance. We're not trying to maintain safety and sacrifice performance. 
right? We want to we want to still win, but we still want to be safe. So that's when this this formula zero approach kicks in over here, saying that as I observe the opponent, initially I don't know much about them. I have a very large robustness ball over there, and then as I get a better estimate, I can now regain my advantage uh, by being adaptive, and 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 so I can preserve this win rate of about almost uh, 59, 60% uh, as, as, as I'm driving, but I, and I'm maintaining high robustness and I'm maintaining high performance because I have this very good estimate of how the other drivers are driving. And so whatever we do you know, in this applied theory part, we also then uh, put it in, in action. And uh, so this is just uh, showing, uh, oh, sorry, I think it's actually connected to Wi-Fi. I can. Let's see if this works. So this is just showing that we have like our lead vehicle and this is our, our agent and then how we are observing. In reality, you have a smaller field of view. You have lots of noise with the LIDARs. And uh, so this takes about 400 to 600 observations before we can go through that. And uh, so, but the point is that we can run this entire algorithm in real time, you know, on a NVIDIA Jetson, two generations older Jetson, and it, it still works quite efficiently. So the big problem with this approach then was, okay, it, it works, it, you know, we are able to sort of show that we can adapt to other agents. Uh, so so one of the issues is that, I mean, we, so the, the good thing about this work was that, okay, you can synthesize, by synthesizing a population of diverse agents, you know, we can have a, a, a way to now, you know, uh, use this distributionally robust uh, online planning to adapt very well, right? And so this combination ad allows us to have these safe but aggressive overtaking uh, opportunities here. The problem with this work was that, you know, what if my opponent is out of distribution? They're not part of, you know, these, these self-play policies that I generated. Then you're gonna have a very high, uh, you know, uncertainty uh, ball. And I'm not going to be able to, I'm just going to be very conservative and I lose out. It's kind of like you're driving on the highway and you see some guy, crazy guy just weaving through. I just want to say, I'm going to stay away from that guy, right? I mean, after I had kids, I said that. Before that, <laughs> I didn't even need caffeine, okay? So, uh, so I, I just drink tea a lot. So, uh, so, so then we said, okay, let's come up with a more, you know, uh, sort of a, a more game theoretic approach. And so we call this planning and policy characteristic space. I'll explain what this, this jargon means. Okay. But, but the idea was that we want to bridge this gap between discrete you know, game theory approaches, but with um, for continuous motion planning with full dynamics. And so we are saying, okay, obviously when you go to full dynamics, you're going to have some you know, explosion in your operation space. So I'll just give you the set of the scenario first. So we, so we have this track here. This is our, our opponent is green, uh, you know, ego is, is, is orange and we're going to race. And uh, in the beginning, essentially this is what this is called. If, in, in this case, we have imperfect information. I know nothing about my opponent's driving behavior, but I have perfect recall. So I'm going to observe, 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 observe. And then I come to a decision point. And at the decision point, I say, hmm, you know how this guy's driving so far, I need to change my policy to another policy to see if I can outcompete them. But, uh, and so then we move to what is called this policy characteristic space, right? So this is some reduced dimensionality space, which just is on aggressiveness and restraint. I'll explain this. That's the whole point of the next few slides. How do we come up with this very abstract space? If the opponent is op operating here and I'm operating here, then I can switch to a policy. These are all policies. Right? I can switch to a policy that is say trivially more aggressive. I've become more aggressive now and then I can outcompete them. I may not be able to outcompete them in the just the next shot, right? So this is an extensive game. So basically, it's a sequential decision-making process 
and then I might not have overtaken them here, then I'm going to figure out another policy that I need to switch to. But I'm just trying to come up with a, this whole game that is over here in this motions planning space is a very, very high dimensional problem. I'll explain what that is. But we want to reduce that dimensionality and just operate in a strategy space. Of how can I just switch policy, policy, policy? I don't want to worry about, oh, they're doing this maneuver, they're doing that maneuver. I just want to come up with a way to do that, right? So the extensive game just means that I can have you know many iterations to compete, but eventually I'm going to get really, really good uh, till I, so, so that I can try to outcome. This is a very simple case to just show you that very quickly. So the vehicle's planning space, right? This is a continuous operation space over here. So the, the state space, the control, uh, the action space, observation space, all intractably large, very large, right? So infinitely large space over here. So the, the second thing is that now if I have a policy, then which policy do I switch to? that game is also in, 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 uh, in fine, infinitely large as a game. So first what we do is we say, okay, offline, we're going to run, just like the previous case, we're going to run many competitions. And here I'm just going to parameterize my agent's decision-making with this weights over here, the weights on the top. And I'm going to decide, okay, if I overtake from the left in this situation with this curve and this, and this velocity and these poses, uh, or if I, if I just follow, or if I take another one. So uh, the, each, the, the agent at every point in time has many costs in their planning, like encourage high speeds, you know, penalize co-occurrence of high speeds and high curvature, you know, don't deviate from the racing line, you still have to be very efficient, maintain some smoothness of your trajectory, don't crash, don't collide with the other agents, don't go out of the track. So there are many costs, all as part of, you know, your planning algorithms. Uh, and this is like a sampling based planning algorithm here. And we're going to run these competitions. And based on the, the parameterization, we're just going to come up with the winners. We're just going to say, okay, these were the winners that won, you know, uh, out of like 10,000 competitions, these won more than others, right? So, because then we need to figure out, okay, how, so we are trying to capture this motion planning into a policy level, right? So. And then we can parameterize these on these, these characteristic spaces over here. So essentially what these, these axes here are, are providing you know, identification in the latent space of the motion planning algorithm, uh, but along two known axes. Because the first part is that we want to maintain continuity in our game. And the second part is we want to maintain interpretability of our actions in this policy space. And so essentially now in this objective space, this is more conservative, more aggressive. I generate now these agents as I parameterize them as elite agents. And I'm going to basically now again run, you know, this in, in our, you know, gradient free uh, uh, sort of evolutionary algorithm of running many, many competitions. So hundreds of thousands of competitions have been running here. And essentially from that, I generate a Pareto frontier of elite policies. These are just policies. Now I need to figure out how do I switch from any policy to another policy and what's the best switching strategy. So for that, we use counterfactual regret minimization. And that's essentially a way to now sort of define what is the most utility that I'll, I'll basically not get by not using a particular switching strategy. And so it's counterfactual. So essentially just saying that, which is a strategy that will give me the best gain uh, but, uh, and, but now to run this counterfactual regret minimization online is not possible. It is very computer intensive. And uh, so what we then do is we just approximate the CFR you know, game and we learn that in, uh, in, a, in a neural network. And so now we basically have an approximated you know, uh, policy switching approach over here. And then we start to run this, this game, right? As we are overtaking and uh, we can execute that in real time, right? So, so we have these, this reduced dimensionality space that we start with for all our, we generate our elite policies and then we generate a, a switching policy. I'm, I'm skipping over a lot of the detail on this, but it's basically saying, okay, what's the best policy I should switch to under, you know, in, in, this, in this situation over here. So, uh, so essentially what we could see is that, you know, with, with these games that we have over here, they, 
Okay, first of all, game theoretic based planning significantly improves the win rate compared to non game theoretic planning. And then, uh, and that's compared with PPO, that's compared with many, you know, uh, 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 very, very com competent, you know, uh, algorithms. But it also generalizes, you know, very well. And so here you can see with the t test, it's a very significant, it's, it's very well established. And then also we can see that uh, it generalizes very well to unseen. Uh, unseen agents and to also unseen maps. So it's just not overfitting just to this map, right? So, uh, so that, that's really important. And that's what we want to, to understand. So, uh, so, so that's sort of, but so it's not always about like if my opponent is here, I'm going to get more and more and more aggressive. Yeah, I'll win in that case. Sometimes if your opponent is very aggressive, you don't want to get too aggressive because you'll crash, right? So this is our interpretability that we can have over here. It's not as good as explainability, but at least you can see my opponent is very aggressive here. I'm going to become less aggressive. And at a later point, I will become more aggressive. I'm just trying to figure out when is the right time to become more aggressive. So again, here I'm becoming less aggressive, more, more, more. My opponent is at, is, is at the peak of aggressiveness over there, right? So, so this is just showing how we can do that. Sorry, the lines are not, the track lines are not being visible here, but this is the same case I was showing you before. How we can overfit on this, right? So, so essentially, what we are defining here is what is a meta strategy to switch between these policies mm -hmm. and generate action, uh, continuous actions, for, given the vehicle's full dynamics, right? This is with the full wheel slip and everything, right? So this this game is running with a pretty like you know uh, uh, high high uh, dimensional, house, very large number of para parametric models for the vehicle also here, and we are. Now, uh, figuring out how to do the switching very efficiently as we go through the threshold. And so this is just all the more nicer figures to explain policy, policy characteristics based in a general manner, rather than just in this racing case. No. And, but it's just saying that, you know, like, okay, in this domain, we know aggressiveness and restraint are two policy characteristics, but we have some domain knowledge. And the question is now, if you apply it to another problem, you know, how can you have few dimensions of your latent space be interpretable and many other dimensions of your latent space be non-interpretable, but these few dimensions can be used to control, you know, the behavior, right? So I'll skip over the details of these here. So, so this, is a, this is part of my team. This is a, I, I run two labs. One is more on the applied theory lab, uh, and then the other is more... Uh, just building electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles. Uh, and uh, so very briefly, uh, uh, and so, so we'd like, a, we have a lot of diversity, many like 11 different countries. We celebrate all festivals in the lab. So it's a very fun lab. Those are my two kids over there. <laughs> and uh, so this is another very interesting problem uh, that we presented last year in Ikra with uh, localization. So, so usually with localization, it's an inverse problem, right? I'm trying to look at the problem behind localization, actually. Localization is just our example. So localization is an inverse problem in the sense that, you know, you give me some LIDAR scans, and I need to estimate what the pose of your vehicle is. But, or if you give me the pose, I can then just project the LIDAR scans and I can generate a map. And uh, that's a forward problem. So the forward problem is usually easy. It's a, called a direct problem. The inverse problem is ill-posed, ambiguous, and that's the hard problem. Mostly you would use like iterative algorithms like a particle filter to estimate, you know, what is a, a good position, the lowest error. So we said, why don't we try to use normalizing flows, but an invertible neural network to solve this kind of inverse problem. So you can actually have now LIDAR scans and you can estimate the pose and you can do both. And so this is the forward problem. I can generate this large city map or this Carla map uh, from uh, from this, and it basically gives you less than you know 0. 0.2 meter accuracy at a city scale. So it, it and it scales very well, right? So uh, it also operates not just with lidars; uh, it also operates with with uh, uh, cameras. And so we use normalizing flows also to augment <laughs> our data uh, gathering. But it's the same structure, but now we're providing images instead of lidar scans, point clouds. And this runs at about 154 hertz on our little uh, 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 race cars. And then here you can see it driving through the corridors. None of these images are real images. They're all generated images in the forward part of the 
the neural network. Uh, and essentially, this is just showing you that, you know, it works in both directions that way. And it also exposes the uncertainty distribution of, on, of the estimation of the localization. Uh, so that allows us to interface it with the ETF and get very, very small error in estimation. And it consumes very low amount of, you know, of the amount of the processor. Uh, so it's a, it's a very lightweight uh, approach. Other research is on, you know, like racing on multi-friction surfaces. So how can you adapt to uh, online, do online uh, state estimation? So this uses an ensemble of uh, Gaussian processes to tune the MPC, the model that we are using in the MPC. Uh, and that allows us to basically dr now drive and then race uh, as it is skidding and drifting through. The, the, uh, and so this is just saying that, you know, as we are going through different friction zones, from very high friction to low friction, uh, uh, then the error is still is still very small uh, compared to other approaches because we are doing this estimation uh, very efficiently. So, so now I'll just for the last few minutes I'll just talk about the the other extracurricular work that we do in the lab. Uh, so one one aspect there are just two parts to this. So one is with F one ten. So we have essentially built this community and these competitions and uh, courses also that are taught in over 80 universities now. Uh, I mean, the community is over 80 universities. There are courses taught in dozens of universities from, uh, you know, TU, uh, Austria, to, uh, uh, to, to Turkey, to, you know, UK, uh, to many, many different places. But the whole point was that when we were thinking about, like, okay, how are we teaching our students? Usually we'll just teach them, like, signal processing. Fourier transforms, and then let's go from that. But we teach that in isolation. So silo, silo, silo. This is my silos. And I was like, okay, well, to build autonomous vehicles, I can't just be that. You need to know all this other stuff that goes there. But you need to work on a system that is you know, complex enough that has all of these knobs to be able to debug, troubleshoot, improve the performance. Uh, but it shouldn't be too complex. Usually when you, know, you graduate from or from university, you go and work in some companies, uh, groups, subdivision, division, division, and then you're just testing, I don't know, you're working on one, one very small subset, right? So you never get to see all of this and to see the system as a whole. So, so we said, why don't we now try to bring this out with uh, our platform that has all these aspects in. And uh, so this is, you can just think of this as, okay, it's like an RC car. So it's actually not that much more complex than that. You know, it's meant not to be that, complex, but it's complex enough. It runs a GPU on board, LIDARs, camera, all compute runs on board. And our whole goal was that it's one-tenth the scale of a full-size vehicle, but it's 10x the fun because you can drive it, you can race it, you can learn all of the stuff that you have learned from different courses, <laughs> and then you can apply that over here, right? So it comes with a simulator. There are 2D simulators for motion planning and control, 3D simulators for perception, and our goal is to help the community build, code, and then race. Everything is open source, everything is documented. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of students have used this now, because we don't want to go, we want to basically go from what you did in high school or an undergrad, uh, where you're just doing sort of, you know, uh, gap finding or obstacle avoidance to running full-blown SLAM. SLAM has been running very efficiently for many years. It's well-documented, uh, no known big bugs in the thing. From simple like you know uh, navigation along a wall or a or a center line to running motion uh, uh, planning algorithms like uh, rapidly exploring random trees and there are whole suites of motion planning algorithms you can run uh, not just in simulation but on the car from going from PID control which we love and hate model three to model predictive control and this is actually a race uh, from 2019 in CPS week in Montreal I think and. Uh, of how this car is doing this sampling-based planning and doing this overtaking. And then we built a course, and the course, the, the best part of this course is that, uh, there are two best parts. One is that it does not have many prerequisites. You just need to know linear systems. The other part is there are no exams. I hate exams, right? <laughs> <laughs> but this was, my, this was my challenge, to see whether the students, especially Penn students, okay, I, I, I'll tell you later on. <laughs> but that if you don't give them a carrot, how much will they work in that, right? So, so in all our races, I've seen them, like they were awake the last two nights, but it's without fear, right? We make the class fun. I don't, I don't scare anybody, right? So, 
And there's no like, oh, your grade will go down or that. There's no talk about a grade. Uh, but they are really, really involved in this because they, they believe they're learning a lot. So we just start from basic, you know, the first six weeks, I mean, first six lectures are basic ROS and how do you get your car up and running? And the car is ready. It's not about the car. It's all about the algorithms now. Okay. And then and they, do, they finish four labs and then they go to race one. Race one is basically just, you don't have a map. You're just reactively planning and driving through and how do you get across? Then you build a map, you start to do SLAM, you come up with you know, local planning algorithms, and then you'd have race two. The car runs much more confidently, much faster, and, uh, and you can actually now tweak everything the way you want it. Then we get into like you know, ethics. I believe ethics is really important. We just, this is 2019, but I just finished that lecture before coming here. And then race line optimization was also this week. And then they basically get to RL, vision, and uh, a lot of the modern stuff that are right. So, and then there's race three <laughs> where they are doing head-to-head -head racing, right? So, and and then the students come up with their own projects in the last month on the topics they like. They write a paper on that, and uh, they have to implement it, right? It can't be in simulation land only. So it does take a good bit of time. Uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of learning-based perception, learning-based planning. And then since the past, you know, he's like these these are the grads from the class. He's head of motions planning in Tesla. NVIDIA autonomy, Honda autonomy. This guy's a YouTube star. He, he worked with us for one year. I can't take any credit. He has like some 9 million subscribers. <laughs> some other professors, they became professors, but, but the whole point is that we want to, it's a very well thought out. So, and, and, and everything is documented, it's not about frustrating software, right? Mm -hmm. This is the web page, helps you build code and race. We have many, many, this is a very old slide. We have this year, we have, and we have competitions. I'll show you what the, this is 2022 in, uh, in Philly, we had ICRA. So now I, I moved from CPS to robotics. And you can see they all come with a, their own cars. You can't spend more money to get faster motors, better processor. It's a battle of algorithms, that are, right? They're mostly awake and happy. <laughs> and then here you can see there's some audio on, but I think it's not coming through. It, it's really live, it's, it's super exciting, like these competitions. And this is ETH Zurich, and you can see how the car is overtaking after many attempts, right? This, I'm just showing you the two, five second clip over here. And the, the, the crowd is like really like, you know, and that's my former postdoc. He's now a professor in TU Munich. Uh, he was amazing, you know, on the mic. So he's coming back to Japan next month for, for the next ICRA. So they all build a map, and then they come up with their racing line strategy, their overtaking strategy. They, they're running SLAM, MPC, motion planning. It's all up to them after that point, but we provide them enough, more than enough to, to go there, right? So, so we'd want to see UC Irvine in this big list. Um, and, and then there are, this was in London last year again, you know, same thing. Uh, and, uh, and then this is, uh, this is in IROS in October last year. You can see how they're weaving through and, you know, very agile, right? So as they're going through. And, uh, and then this is a very fun video. I'll, I'll skip it, but I'll share the link. This is the, actually the, the audio is really amazing of this video. It's the Gen Z people know how to make videos. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I can't make any videos like this. So basically he's talking about how do you come up with a strategy planning approach, but with the tools that are there, right? So he's like, you look at the wheel slip, you're looking at every, all the different things, right? And in, in the voice of uh, our, our real racing people. And then the, the community, this was a freshman from uh, Waterloo. He, yeah, he's my former student's uh, uh, student now. Uh, who's, uh, and they have lots of views, right? If I get like 60 views, I'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of views over here. So, uh, so it's good, it's good. Other people make videos, I can't do that. So this year, this is also very outdated. This year we will be in seven competitions, I mean in seven conferences, from CPS Week to ICRA, IROS, uh, uh, that's in the robotics community, transportation community, and controls come, will also be in uh, CDC in Milan. So it'll be uh, Japan, uh, Hong Kong, South Korea, Milan, and then Canada. And Abu Dhabi will be IROS, right? We also have a lot of workshops. These are like the really crazy people who do like full-scale autonomous drifting, uh, controls PhD from Stanford and Coira Research. This, this, this guy is very interesting. He's a co-founder of Kiva. Basically, he's a, you know, independently wealthy guy, but he's also like a crazy guy. He, 
he wrote a nature paper on superhuman racing, right? So that qualifies a lot of our work now. And, uh, and then after that, we have this, our workshops on, you know, multiplayer dynamic games. This is more on the theoretical side, right? There's no system stuff. No, none of these guys are like systems people uh, over here. Yeah, maybe this guy from MathWorks, but nobody else. Oh. And then, so this is a very good community and there's a lot of, you know, activity in it. And I welcome all the students. Uh, if you need a car, we'll even give you a car for a semester for free. Right. So, and then the last thing is with AutoWare, we said, okay, how do we get to industry now? So AutoWare is actually like a autonomous driving software stack. It runs on buses, it runs on, in, in Michigan, uh, robo taxis, in, in, in Tokyo, uh, and all of these. This is a I mean, people, um, goods moving thing. It even runs on indie autonomous racing cars. Okay, right? There are many companies that are part of this. I serve on the board of AutoWare. And, uh, and through that, we also have the R&D portion for centers of excellence. And all these professors here across the world, they all have a vehicle that runs AutoWare. And that's why we are here also, which we have AutoWare uh, you know, from UC Irvine also. And then, uh, and then as we as we go through this, here we have Josh. I can include both of y'all. Mm -hmm. uh, but 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 the, the idea is that they they all are running AutoWare, and then we can do research based on that. As academics, we don't want to waste time on the nuts and bolts of getting a stupid car to run. We just want to do our research, right? That's why this whole thing is there. We have a garage lab which builds electric vehicles, and then does a lot of the AV portion of it because. The platforms are changing to very standard skateboard chassis. And then we can run AutoWare at 110 scale in our electric go-karts and on industrial, like full size vehicles. And this is just showing you like a four-month project where the students developed a drive-by-wire, brake-by-wire, steer-by-wire uh, system. And everything again here is a so it's called open AV for open EV. And everything is documented. And now uh, many of these uh, have gone into many uh, different AutoWare participants are reproducing these and they will, it'll become a next generation race as we go through that. And this is one of the sort of simulators that are part of that, that, that was designed. This is all done by master students. This is a second lab that I run in, that's just next to our campus. It's a 23 acre facility for robotics. And, you know, and then they got a digital twin of that, but it's running all the algorithms on that, right? So, and, and it's open source. They won some competition, the racing competition in Purdue last year. And uh, uh, so this is just to wrap it up. I think, you know, there are a lot of very exciting problems in how we have multi-agent play strategies, but with improvisation. And, uh, and also like, you know, explainability in these systems. Uh, we've come to interpretation, but that's it. And then there's, you know, lots of other problems with imitation learning with, you know, multiple uh, weak experts and so on. But I'll stop here. Thank you so much. So, do we have time for questions? So, Zoom is already yeah, yes. over. Yeah, yeah. Next time. Next time. We can have time for a few questions, maybe a couple of questions. After. So uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, you have to come up with these uh, unique uh, features, and then uh, I think there is like some kind of basis, and then you're trying to find maybe a combination. So could everyone please stay and, for the questions? Uh, you mentioned please you need down. to make sure they are diverse. So what yeah, kind of uh, metric you are using to make sure they are diverse? Yeah, so we are not we don't have a metric forcing yeah. diversity, no. but we when we evaluate them, we are of the elite is picking the ones that are more. So diverse in terms of like the distance between yeah, the project yeah. which they are taking. Yeah, so diversity is in in, in their, uh, yeah, how, how they are overtaking, that they don't overtake all of the similar race line. Mm -hmm. And so we are seeing that they are across the distribution. Yes. And also diversity. So diversity for single agent and diversity in a multi-agent setting. So both have a trade. Yeah, but but there's a lot of interest in okay, how do you introduce diversity as part of the design? Uh, but that it becomes very sensitive because you know diversity matters, but it's not like all of them does. We, we don't want it to dominate. You can have a small bit. How did you project the policy on kitty space? Yeah. Yeah. So we here we are. You mean 
the policy. But where it was like the graph addressif and so. And so yeah, on. yeah. So so each policy is associated with a parametric uh, uh, set for uh, the the drive with the the motion planning, and so we directly uh, capture if, if we have that motion planning. Uh, a behavior captured as as a network, and we're directly activating that. We're just uh, we're just uh, resetting the parameters of the vehicle to reflect uh, what what the parameters are for that policy. Um, can I ask a quick question? So, uh, have you measured the exploitability of those cars, or are you just measuring against the fixed population? The, the Exploitability in what sense? So, in, uh, with respect to the best response, sort of. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in in this case, we are we are really looking at. Uh, that, that's a good. I think we are coming to that problem right now. That is actually the current formulation when we set it up in a PSRO setting to really look at. You know, in in the in a discrete case, you can have this exploitability very clear. In a continuous case. It's very hard to know what is the Nash equilibrium, right? We we don't know the Nash equilibrium for this case, so then therefore we don't know what, what is your exploitability, right? So so yeah, I think that's our that's where my my students are currently frustrated that they're like, how do we define you know an equilibrium case here? We don't know how to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You said that it's hard to use prior knowledge or data, right? Yeah, but. Don't you think there are some common sense rules, like, I don't know, the drivers don't want to die, for example. I mean, some common sense rules that we can still use. Yeah, yeah. We encode those in the cost functions okay. for the planner. And, uh, and and we could encode more. But I think the, the whole idea was, what if we don't encode much? Okay. Like that, right? Can we? Uh, it's, it's kind of like we are we are in this RL regime, but we want to not, you know, be too prescriptive. But yeah, you could, you could have a, a long start the whole process by having say like people have like you know whatever like these uh, motion planning <laughs> primitives for that right so that that capture this so you can do that yes definitely in our case we were just like okay how much effort is it to go from zero to to expert yeah but we would normally we would do that yeah we didn't have to write a proof I yeah, also want to ask more. So, uh, because uh, at the beginning, we, when you started to talk about autonomous driving, you sound a bit negative about the future of it, because uh, you were saying, okay, so at the beginning, I mean, it's a very hard, uh, very hard problem to solve, and then there, for those ones who has a business in the model, uh, they also face the regulations. Saying, so th this is actually happening in some in, in some Francisco like, like right now. So now the, I would say the only surviving the company is is probably Waymo now, uh, but then uh, as as a I mean, this is a very, very rare chance. I, I also want to kind of ask like your vision of it. Do you really think it's going to be there? Or it's, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, I think the question is, what do we mean by it's going to be there? Yes. So uh, in passenger cars, it's a very fragmented market, you know, and uh, so I, I, you know, in this ethics lecture that we model decision-making lecture that we had earlier this week, I just asked the students, look, you know, Waymo or Tesla is, is is developing these cars. They want to introduce them. 500 are coming around Irvine, around this campus, right? Because they want to test it in wild. Is it okay if few people die along the way so we can save more people? And then most engineers are like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then, then I say, okay, you don't have kids, right? And, and, uh, and then what if like, one of the people is like your sibling or someone, right? I have to make it personal and attack them like that. Then all the hands go down. Maybe one guy is. <laughs> so, so I think for passenger cars, I think it's it's too fragmented a space. There is no clear business model why it should be there, uh, besides convenience. You know, but what is how do you how do you price convenience? I'm not a business guy, right? So the and then for trucking, there's the same problem. They say, oh, well, well it'll it's really good for trucking, but you need a safety driver. If you don't have safety driver. Just two truck, major truck accident with a semi truck, boom, the whole industry. You see that in the medical industry, right? It dies for about 12 to 15 years, and then it'll come back with a new face and a new name. All these medical device companies, they keep rebrand, changing their name, okay? Like, uh, especially pharma companies. Uh, after they acquire someone, like, so Guidant was an old company, it came up as a Boston Scientific, changed the name, whitewashed everything. So, 
but but where where will it work? I think where is autonomy? So we are using autonomy like you know a lot in logistics, uh, with uh, you know in in warehouses, cross docks, distribution centers. It works really well there. Okay, I don't mean autonomous forklifts. There are many variations of that. There's a, that's a very vibrant space. Closed systems, it works really well. Uh, not a new point, right? I'm I'm just saying the same thing. It's, it it works in a restricted space. The same autonomous systems, like we used it in, like you know, in in trucks, but they replace the mirrors with cameras because they have bigger blind spots. These eighteen wheeler trucks, and then that basically can now the cameras can provide full situational awareness and help them dock better, help them drive better, so they don't hit the curbs, they don't crash into. So we're just using them as not fully autonomous. We're using them in across this ADAS spectrum, right? We're pushing the ADAS spectrum. Oh. Yeah, I think in the retail market, very difficult. Right? Like maybe they do it in China for now, but it's all like it's not a money making mm -hmm. sort of business. So yeah. in my so non business perspective. So this includes uh, the Robo Taxi. This is Robo Taxi. Yeah, yeah, yeah Robo Taxi. So what they're doing in Japan with Automare is that the government has a program in all the city, like about 27 cities. That's how Automare and, and the, the companies behind Automare make money. Okay, they are actually making money. So one of the companies is over $380 million funded company called Tier 4 uh, that's behind Autoware. And uh, so, so they, are, they have, they're running all these, these bus services from the station to the office park, or, you know, like suppose like if there was a station close by here to, to, to the campus and back, and they're running these loops and they, those are actually very profitable. Initially, like, and it's running in Korea, it's running in Taiwan, it's running in Japan. Initially, they are profitable because the government provides subsidies. And after like seven years or something, the government says, okay, now you're on your own. You have to run it as a service. But it took about five to six years to prove that they can, you know, run it. Uh, so it's still a pretty, it's called a milk run. Uh, the other one is, was, uh, I don't know if you remember, there was one goods moving vehicle that's running in over 32 large factories for intra logistics, basically like a methane gas pro processing plant where they take the intermediate products every uh, about 30 times a day. They need to get barrels of the intermediate products from pl production plant one, two, and three to the testing facility that's two miles away. They need to repeat that 30 times every 24 hours. And that's doing that indoor, outdoor driving, but it's all on private property. These are like large, you know, anywhere from six acres to 1,200 acres, automotive production, uh, consumer good production plants. So their automation is running really, really well. Very, very boring places, you wouldn't see them, uh, but I visit them, Yamaha factories, Samsung factories, uh, Panasonic factories, all of them, right? So, uh, but, uh, but they, they run and, and they have profitable businesses, uh, but they are not going to hit your unicorn status. Uh, okay. okay, we can we can probably, probably that one yeah, more, yeah. but thank you so much.